I'm Marcus Blake here at the Studio at That Nerd Show, and we're doing a virtual Great. interview from the Naples Film Festival uh, with director Alice Gu. And we're going to be talking about the movie The Donut King. Um, so I'm going to tell you right off the bat, this was my favorite documentary of the festival. Uh, loved it. I watched it a couple of times because um, I feel like the first time I did, I missed a few things. Uh, but it was incredibly fascinating. Uh, about the rise of donut shops in California and kind of how they spread. So how did you get involved in this project? Uh, I found the story through, you know, inadvertently through my nanny of all things. Um, she had brought home, well, my husband had brought home these high end donuts from, you know, one of these gourmet places around us. And right. she, actually you know, politely declined. She said, no, thank you. I, I only eat Cambodian donuts. And we're like, what is a Cambodian donut? And we're like, but we're like, don't you know, these are from Huckleberry. These are like the farm to table. Like these are the amazing. She's like, no, no, I, you know, I just eat Cambodian donuts. And she goes, yeah, I found a Cambodian donut shop, Cambodian donuts, Cambodian donuts. This goes on for a couple of days. You know, of course my head is spinning. I'm like, what are I Cambodian donut? And she finally brings one home for us. I brought you a Cambodian donut. I said, oh, I can't wait to try this like confection that I've never had before. You know, and I, my husband and I, we both take a bite and it's a glazed donut. Uh, you know, your clay, glazed donut, you know, the classic glazed donut. And we said, okay, this is delicious, but this is a classic glazed donut. She says, yes, but this is a Cambodian donut. We're like, what makes this Cambodian? This is just Cambodian people make them. I said, Cambodian people make a regular classic American donut. It's still right. like American donut. She says, no, it's Cambodian people going on and on. And she's like, look it up. And I said, I'm gonna look it up. You know, and I looked it up and all of these articles came up about the Donut King. This is why your donut boxes are pink. Right. The donut shops in California. I mean, I read everything, I was riveted. And I just knew right then and there that I had to tell the story. Well, it was funny, I, I, I hadn't really thought about it until I saw the documentary and I did my own research like you and started looking things up and I'm like, that's why we have a pink box. Oh, and <laughs> that's why every place I go to, because we're here in Dallas mm -hmm. um, and all around me, I mean, there's a huge Asian community and stuff and uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, and that's the donut shops. And I just never really thought about it. And then I went and got donuts this morning and I asked the lady at this place I've been going to, it's like, you know who the donut king is? And she's like, oh yeah. <laughs> it's, no like, it's like, really? Okay. So this isn't just something I learned briefly from a documentary. It is, okay. It's, it's like oral storytelling. It's been passed no matter where you go into the country and have a donut shop. It's, um, he's the man, the myth, the legend. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and it's kind of interesting too, whether they talk about donuts is the one thing that you'll just never, you're never going to get rid of in society. They're always going to be there. Uh, and, and again, I'm kind of like you, like, well, I like fancy donuts. You know, I love beignet when you go to New Orleans. Yeah. But it makes it, after seeing this, it makes you kind of examine that basic glazed donut. Like there really is a lot of hard work and sweat that goes into oh making God. donuts. And there's a whole history behind it. So, um, what was what was the most fascinating thing that you discovered uh, doing this doc documentary? Oh God, loaded question. Um, <laughs> I mean, so many things. I mean, like like you, you know, donuts are I mean, they're ubiquitous here, you know, right. and I feel like they're kind of ubiquitous all over the country, you know, donut shops and you know, to be honest, you know, I was, you know, I ate pretty healthy. So, you know, I, I'm not going to a donut shop every day, but I'm certainly familiar. like you, I've noticed that 
a couple donut shops have Asian people working in them. Right. And I was like, oh, okay, well, these are like the couple shops, you know? And, but yeah, it was fascinating to discover that it is a whole network. I was also, my mind was also blown about the pink box because I've seen it throughout the years. Oh, yeah. The Simpsons. I mean, donuts are just, they're everywhere. And they're fun. Yeah. And you don't really think about them. And they're, they're fun. They're silly. They're um, sprinkles. They're pink. And it's an empty calorie sugary food. Right. We don't think of at all. Like never a second thought. But this little sugary treat that kind of means nothing to many people was a lifeline for an entire community of people. Right. That, that was how they survived, fed their family, housed their family, sent kids to college. I can't think of a better story of the American dream, going from refugees from a war that we probably, you know, we shouldn't have been involved in in the first place, to here you are as immigrants, you know, partaking of the American dream, building businesses, becoming part of the community, you know, American citizens, and it's... I know it's just a film about donuts and the donut king, but I also kind of feel like it's we're in a politically charged society where one side doesn't really like immigrants, you know, mm -hmm. it's and but talks about the American dream and small business and yada, yada, yada. Like, yes, but here's a model of how that happened and how that industry built up. That is the American dream, you know? So yeah. it's, did you, when you got this film out, did you kind of feel like, or did you have any intentions of kind of having a political motive behind it, or were you just telling a story? Uh, you know what? I was just telling a story when I, when I researched it and I saw all the articles. I was like, oh my god, this is fascinating. I have to tell this story because it's right. super inspirational and this is optimistic. And you know, my parents came to pursue the American dream, and I'm the product of that. I right. I get to do what I love for a living. I'm not baking donuts. You know, my parents didn't own donut shops, but I get to pursue a career in the arts, you know, which is right. completely the American dream for, as, you know, as far as immigrants come. Um, but no, I, I didn't set out to have any political tones and, you know, I didn't want it to come across too politically charged one way or another. I just wanted to present some, a story right. that wherever your political leanings may lie, you may have a second thought or you may, maybe you had a preconceived notion of what an immigrant is or what a refugee is. Right. And this really shows if given a chance, how they can contribute, how their kids contribute, how they yeah. become, you know, how we become a really diverse and robust America. And right. I have to say actually what did really surprise me in doing the research and these, these were things I just didn't know, you know, uh, the Refugee Act, President Ford, issuing the executive order, the one and only time in American history yeah. to refugees. Um, Jerry Brown, the governor of California, twice. Yeah. You know, we recently saw as, oh, Jerry Brown is always the voice of reason. Well, Jerry Brown in 1975, you know, as, as you see in the film, he was like, no, we don't want these people here. Unemployment is high. I'm reluctant to let these people in when Americans are out of work. And that's something that you hear still now. Yeah. And President Ford, I have to say, his speech, the first time I heard it, my mind was blown. I, my eyes watered with tears. It was so inspirational. This was like tremendous leadership. Right. And I it doesn't matter whether you're Republican or Democrat, it's just the human thing to do. It's the right thing to do for displaced refugees that are just looking, trying to survive and want a better life.
I, I don't, the second time I watched it, I had that discussion with a uh, friend of mine. You know, I mean, obviously everybody's talking politics these days. Uh, and I'm like, I, I get that the, there is a subtle political story there, but it is the story of every American. We are all the children of immigrants, somehow, some way, you know, unless we're Native American. Um, but that's what better, again, what better story can you tell? You hope that you can make a better life for yourself for your kids and generations to go. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, the other thing that I really loved is talking about the difference in generations as you talk about the other shop um, at the end of the dock about the daughter coming back from school and rebranding everything and putting it into the 21st century using Instagram and redoing these donuts and adding like 120 new recipes, <laughs> you know? Wow. And, yeah. And I thought that was kind of incredible of the difference in how you approach a business from different generations of keeping it alive. You know, the cop being interviewed in uh, outside the donut shop, he was probably my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Just I make Yeah. I All right. So I got to ask, who came up with the rap song at the end? Because it's very catchy. We found it. Really? We found it. We had these amazing music supervisors, Liza Richardson and Dan Wilcox. And, and I said, this is, the, this is the kind of tone I'm looking for. Go, search, find. <laughs> and this guy, he goes by Yogi Bars. It has everybody is saying that song is so catchy. Yeah. So fun. But you know, you know, my first thought was, I remember when the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air came out and everybody went to school and was singing the song. And, and 30 years later, you know that song. I feel like <laughs> the donut song is going to be right there on the same level. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It's awesome. Um, so I'm assuming you got to, in doing this documentary, you got to kind of sample some new recipes and donuts. Yeah. Um, did you discover a new recipe or a new kind of donut that you really love that you kind of get to recommend? Well, I have to say the cronut o nut is new. <laughs> that was new to me. And with that special cream and oh, yeah. it's pretty, I mean, like it's, those are pretty like new flavor, amazing flavor sensations. I, I have to say though, I am a bit of a purist. I, <laughs> and, you know, I love an old. I love a glaze. I love the old school original donuts. Right. And in filming at DK's one night when they were filming, you know, they were making those buttermilk bars. You know, and I'd eaten so many donuts, and mainly the donut princess is like, "Do you want one?" And I said, "No, <laughs> no, I've had enough." And she's like, "You don't eat the whole thing." She's like, "I can quarter it for you." I said, oh, "Okay, yeah, I'll I'll have a bite." And she's like, "You can share it with the rest of your crew." So. She quartered it and I had a quarter. I never had a buttermilk bar within 30 seconds of leaving the fryer and being glazed. It was an out of body experience. So needless to say, I did not end up sharing that donut with anybody else. I ate I, I wouldn't think so. <laughs> it was like zing, it was all the endorphins, it was all the dopamine hits. I mean, it was it was everything. What um what happened uh, with the cease and assist that the uh, the guy in New York sent about the donut? Uh, I, I love the story of her talking about, yes, but I get up and I make my own unique cream. <laughs> yes. But did that did that go anywhere? I'm not sure. It, you know, I think it did. They, they had to change the name. They called it the DK. You know, it's DK and they use the K for cronut. Okay. Uh, so they just had to change the name to O-Nut. Ah, okay. And, and it's different enough. Well, as long as I didn't have to get rid of the recipe, because that would be a crying shame. And I'm like, I get it if you were a donut shop in New York, where it might be like infringing, but you're on the other coast. <laughs> but. I, you know, I, I have to say, our, our publicist, he said after working on this, you know, he's been, you know, pushing hard for like a week or two. And he said, you know what, I had to go get a cronut today. And he's like, I got one from Dominique Ansel. He's like, I paid ten dollars for it. He's like, it was really good. He's like, but I really wanted the one from California. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. And I've got a kid sister that lives in Queens. Um, 
and she uh, she's mentioned that before too. And I messaged her the other night. I was like, yeah, but I know you like your donut. But you gotta check out this documentary when it comes out too. You know, oh, is that, if you go to, yeah, because if you go to California, then you know, go to this, go to VKs. Uh, all right, so we always like to ask our filmmakers one nerdy question. We're gonna test your inner nerd here. All right, you ready? I'm ready. If you could have a superpower or a weapon of choice within the nerd universe to fight the forces of evil, what would you choose? I would just choose to be able to channel the force for good. Nice. And um, I am a complete nerd. Um, I talk about Star Wars almost on the daily and I actually do try. This, this is very California, but I do try to meditate every day to harness the force for good. Guys, great answer. I think we could all use a lot of that. 